care for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Senator from Iowa. I would ask to speak in morning business for about 20 minutes. Without objection. Yeah. And I also ask permission at the end of my remarks to insert some letters that I'll be speaking about. Without objection. Recently, uh, the Obama administration has been talking a lot about income inequality and poverty. Yesterday, I spoke about uh, the issue about the war on poverty, its successes and its failures. Uh, as I said yesterday, the U.S. has spent trillions of dollars in the last 50 years fighting the so-called war on poverty. I said yesterday that the results have been marginal in some cases successful, re reducing the poverty rate down from 19 percent down to the 15 percent it is now, but a lot more needs to be done. Now, in the fight against the war on poverty, this administration, like a lot of administrations, wants to spend more money on more programs. Uh, some of that may be justified. But that doesn't seem to fix the problems. If you just hand this money out with no strings and no oversight, it gets diverted and misused. And that's the purpose of my speaking today on the subject of public housing. Wasted money doesn't help the poor. There are a lot of people who make a nice profit from the poverty of others. And this administration has been helping a number of these profiteers while the poor suffer. I want to be clear that some of these issues I'm talking about, their genesis go back to previous administrations as well. Through my oversight work, I've seen this happen over and over again, that a few people profit from trying to help the poor, but the money doesn't go there. The Department of Housing and Urban Development hands out $4 billion in federal money every year to local housing authorities. This money is supposed to help provide clean, affordable, safe housing for the poor. But while no one is watching, so much of the money gets spent on high salaries and perks for the people who run the housing authorities. These housing authorities have other sources of money, but most of them, up to 90 percent of their total funding, comes from the $4 billion contributed by the federal taxpayers. Housing and urban develop development argues that because housing authorities are state and local government entities, there is no reason to scrutinize them from here in Washington, D.C. Now, as far as I'm concerned, HUD is missing for four billion reasons. Those are dollar reasons. Taxpayer money should come to make sure that the federal authorities that disperse it make sure that they oversee that it's spent in the legal way and to help the people that need the help. I've been conducting oversight of the wasteful spending at housing authorities for almost four years. I've been urging the Obama administration to look at what is happening and to take action. But there is little, if any, interest in the oversight of these federal dollars by the folks writing the checks here in Washington, D.C. They just want to send the check and pat themselves on the back. They don't want to talk about what actually happens to the money once it's dispersed. Federal funds end up feathering the nest of local housing bureaucrats instead of housing for the poor. And I'll show you how that's done. Here are some of the most egregious examples, then, of how ineffective the Department of Housing and Urban Development has been at policing local housing authorities. Bradenton, Florida. 
is an area of the country which was hit extremely hard during the foreclosure crisis. But employees at Bradenton Housing Authority only have to work four days a week. They get two weeks off at Christmas, bonuses in June and December, and the option to cash out up to a month of sick leave twice per year. They get free use of a car purchased by the Housing Authority. After 15 years of employment, they get to keep the car when they leave or take $10,000 instead. It's their choice. There, there are generous fringe benefits, but many housing authorities also provide very lucrative salaries. These salaries far exceed the salaries of federal employees right here in Washington, D.C., who hand out the taxpayers' money to the housing authorities. The biggest salary jackpot winners that I've encountered so far are the Atlanta Housing Authority. At least 22 employees there earn between $150,000 and $303,000 per year. The Atlanta Housing Authority benefits from a special HUD designation called Moving to Work. That program exempts designated housing authorities from certain requirements, including salary justifications. This is not just an isolated example. The executive director of the Raleigh, North Carolina Housing Authority receives about $280,000 in salary and benefits, plus up to 30 vacation days. He also accumulates comp time for, an, for any hours he works, over seven and a half hours per day. He's used over 20 days of comp time per year since 2009. Add that to his regular vacation time, and he's out of the office nearly three months per year. Nine months of work for $280,000 is an annualized salary of $375,000 per year. Very few taxpayers funded jobs, pro, uh, very few taxpayer funded jobs pay anything close to that amount. So what's the justification? The justification for such high salaries? particularly considering the fact that they're supposed to provide safe, affordable uh, housing for low-income people. After years of ignoring the issue, HUD finally capped federal funding for executive salaries at $155,500 per employee. Of course, this was only after various local media and I exposed deep-rooted problems and pushed the Department of Housing and Urban Development to act. But now, Housing Authority executives have turned to creative accounting tricks to get around that limit of $155,500 per employee. Since some of their money comes from other sources, the Housing authorities simply claim that any salary over the federal limit comes from one of those other sources, whereas the money from those other sources ought to be used to help low-income people have affordable, clean, and safe housing. Because of my oversight letters on this subject, HUD recently notified the housing authorities that they must document the original source of the funding used to pay salaries over the federal limit. Now, that's good news, but there are still larger problems. The Department is still not making this salary data public in a reasonable time frame. I'll give you an example. This administration refused to release the 2010 set of data for almost a year. I hope we don't have to wait a year for getting the most recent data. Like many of our federal agencies, some housing authorities spend large amounts of money on travel for conferences and training. Now, some of that may be legitimate, but I'm raising questions about the extent to which it's done and the amount of money that's consumed. Staff and board members often attend the same conferences throughout the United States year after year. They often attend multiple conferences in a single year. In addition to travel costs, 
housing authorities must pay a conference fee for each attendee they send, often ranging from $400 at the low end to $1,000 per employee at the higher end. That money could easily be used to improve conditions and make needed repairs in public housing facilities, but instead it's frittered away on conferences. In other words, forget the low-income people you're supposed to be helping and spend, spend the money someplace else. The Tampa Housing Authority has spent more than $860,000 since 2009 for staff and board members to attend various conferences, seminars, and training programs. $860,000 that could have been used to provide affordable housing for low-income people. Tampa also has been spending, sending 20 or more employees per year to conferences sponsored by the National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials. That alone costs more than $177,000 per year. The Atlanta Housing Authority has spent more than $480,000 since 2009 for the employees to attend conferences and training centers, sessions. In fact, the Housing Authority paid over $68,000 in conference fees to a software company after giving them a multi-million dollar contract for a new computer system. Now, I wonder, but I don't know, but I think it's legitimate to question if the Housing Authority Executive Director thought to ask for a discount. Many of the Housing Authorities with questionable spending don't limit the abuses to salaries or travel. The Tampa Housing Authority purchased a new $7 million administrative office that includes nearly $3 million in renovations and upgrades. That could have helped hundreds of, if not thousands, of poor people needing the housing. They're also paying nearly $800,000 in salary and benefits for a public relations department, while at the same time paying an employee another $170,369 as a PR consultant. Other housing authorities are also spending exorbitant amounts for outside consultants. Some of these consultants are former employees of a local housing authority. In 2013, the Pittsburgh Housing Authority retained 10 law firms for a total of $3.5 million over three years. One law firm has been representing the Housing Authority during inquiries by the Department of Housing and Urban Development here in Washington, D.C., uh, of the Office of Inspector General and the City Controller. Now think about that. It's bad enough that taxpayers' money meant to help the poor is wasted, but when the taxpayer also pays the lawyers to defend the very organization from scrutiny about whether the taxpayer's money was wasted is even more outrageous. And of course that just adds insult to injury. In Philadelphia, outside lawyers blocked the Inspector General's office from assessing spending data for months. And that costs the taxpayers billions of dollars. The Pittsburgh Housing Authority also paid outside consulting firm one and a quarter million dollars in the year 2012. The vice president at the consulting company billed the Housing Authority $404,000 for 2,400 hours of work. That's 48 hours a week for a year. It is more than double the $168,000 salary of the Housing Authority Executive Director. Harris County, Texas is one of the most egregious examples of out-of-control spending. In 2013, the HUD Inspector General questioned the mismanagement of over $27 million in the federal uh, funding for Harris County. The IG provided the following examples of fraud and abuse over one and seven-tenths million dollars in excessive payroll expenses, $190,000 for statues and monuments, $66,000 for employee shirts embossed with logos, $27,000 for trophies, plaques, and awards, $14,500 for a helicopter 
a chartered bus and golf cart rentals for a grand opening and $18,000 for letters written by Abraham Lincoln. I continue to send my oversight letters to the Senate Appropriators and the Senate Banking Committee, and it's these letters that I have gotten permission to put in the record at the end of my statement. Uh, the Senate Appropriators and the Senate Banking Committee members have jurisdiction over the Department of Housing and Urban Development. They have the authority to do something about these abuses. My colleagues need to know the extent of the problems and that I'm ready to work with the members of this body to address these issues. Employment, employment at public housing authorities should be, uh, uh, employment at public housing authorities should be about public service. That's why we have a program serving the needs of the low income. It's supposed to be providing clean, safe, affordable housing for those in need, not helping bureaucrats live, uh, live high on the hog at, at the taxpayer's dime. Now, I said in my opening, this problem didn't start with this administration, uh, for sure. There's a culture here that had to start back a long ways away. But now, bringing these problems to the attention of this administration, I hope that it will take them seriously. And if this administration is truly serious about income inequality and not just using it for political purposes, it would stop shoveling taxpayers' money out the door with practically no oversight, no controls, and no limits and the waste of money that I've just expressed. If President Obama is truly serious about income inequality, he would take the money that high-income public housing authorities waste and give it to the benefit of low-income uh, patrons uh, uh, of, for, uh, of the public housing to provide what the law is meant to provide these people safe, affordable, healthy housing. I yield the floor. And uh, I, sh I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Work on the flood insurance bill is the agenda item today. That legislation would delay scheduled federal flood insurance rate increases for about four years. We expect more debate on that in just a couple of moments. The State of the Union address takes place tonight. Our coverage starts at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN with President Obama's speech to get underway at 9. And after the President's speech, the Republican response will be from Kathy McMorris Rogers, the Republican Conference Chair. A reminder that you can see and hear the State of the Union address live on C-SPAN, also on C-SPAN Radio and C-SPAN.org. We'll include your phone calls, and again, it all gets underway starting at 8 Eastern. Earlier today, we spoke with a member of Congress about tonight's State of the Union address and the congressional agenda. Here's more of that discussion now. Things to say real quick. I typically judge our folks in D.C. by their actions, and I look at their policies, not necessarily their uh, party affiliations. However, uh, listening to you today, I, I think you're in a bit of denial for the simple fact of three reasons. You sit there and talk about getting something done and how we need to have a better economy and more jobs, yet last year was the biggest do-nothing Congress that we've had for probably ever. And as well, when we're talking about um, the president doing something on jobs and you talking about how he's not trying to accomplish anything with jobs in the economy, when he was the only one that put forward a jobs bill that did not get through. And the Republicans put no job bills on the table to even look at getting more jobs. And the third thing being the minimum wage. You, your perception of the people earning minimum wage is completely wrong. Statistics clearly show today's minimum wage earners are adults trying to survive and raise a family on. They're working 80 hours or more a week and can't get by, can't make a living. So while job creation is great and we definitely need to look at more job training and more job creation, you can't simply leave the folks not being able to survive working okay. 40 hours a week. Caller, thanks. Well, uh, thank you and good morning in Ohio. Uh, listen, um, as far as a do-nothing Congress, I think you've got to really, you equate the number of bills passed with um, progress as a conservative? Not necessarily. I wouldn't necessarily equate the two. Now, I will tell you in the House of Representatives, we have passed more than 150 bills that now sit in the United States Senate. I would look to Harry Reid and the, in the United States Senate and just look at the number of bills that are sitting there that they have taken no action on. Most people are surprised, for instance, the 112th Congress, it was my bill because I know about this, we actually passed an immigration reform bill. We passed it. And it dealt with high-tech visas, it dealt with family-based visas. It passed with only 15 dissenting votes in the House of Representatives. Do you think that Harry Reid and the Democrats would take that up and vote on that uh, in, in the United States Senate? No, it never even got a vote. And so if you're going to look at it objectively, I would also look at the United States Senate, which is controlled by the Democrats. I'm not saying that we are perfect over here in the House as, as Republicans, but I think it's erroneous to equate number of bills passed with, with necessarily with progress. We also, in my humble opinion, don't have a president that engages in this process. There is nothing you can point to to show me that the president of the United States over the last five years has actively engaged to work with the opposition. But that's who we are in this nation. That's what we do. We, we have to reach our hand out and, and come up with compromise. But I don't see that from this, from this White House. And as it relates to, to minimum wage, your, your last point there, Let's look at Obamacare, because one of the big things that Obamacare really hurts, and I see this in town hall after town hall, is this, uh, this uh, penalty, if you will, or this requirement that some um, people are, are, have 40-hour-a-week uh, minimum wage jobs only under Obamacare to get pushed a little bit so that the maximum amount of time that they can log is 29 hours. I had a woman in my town hall with tears running down her face said, you know what? I am a single mom, I am working hard, and now my employer is going to move you from 40 hours a week down to 29 hours a week to meet a requirement with an Obamacare. I've got to go find another job. These types of things are, are, are really destructive and, and, and difficult and, and absolutely wrong. So if you want to help tackle that, let's repeal Obamacare. Let's try Kyle Jacobson from Texas Tech again. Go ahead. Hi, can you hear me all right this time? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Go ahead, John, sir. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my question is about the job market for college graduates. Um, that's a concern for college students all across the nation. Uh, Mr. Chaps, what do you think could be done to strengthen our economy? 
Well, thank you. Good morning in Texas. I think I heard most of that question, but we have this whole array of students that are getting ready to graduate. I got a son who is going to college. My daughter is entering to college, and that's one of the big concerns, right? You get through the process, you work hard, you do what you're supposed to do, you get your degree, and, and then what? Um, look, my argument is that the policies of President Obama and the Democrats have not worked. The Democrats had the House the Senate, the presidency for the first two years of this administration. They invested in bigger, broader government, more government. I mean, just look, they spent $787 billion that was supposed to stimulate the economy. It didn't. It failed. They did things like cash for clunkers, for goodness sake. Do you think that really drove a lot of jobs so that you can now find one in the marketplace? No, we didn't. So we have a host of things here. You have to deal with the health care segment. I think the health care is one of the biggest unknown costs. You have rising premiums, you have people paying more into this process. I think the country is starting to realize that when President Obama said you were on average going to save $2,500 per family, that's not true. Um, the president's had to walk back the idea that you could keep your health care. When it represents 27% of the economy, you have to deal with this in a responsible way and create some certainty or it's going to exacerbate the problem. We also believe that the energy sector, particularly in Texas, should be one that is thriving. But when you look at the development or the extraction of resources on public lands, it's not happening. It's not happening. We are thriving in North Dakota, where it's on private property, but out west, where we have a lot of public lands, this government under, under President Obama has done everything they can to put a stranglehold on the development of good, real jobs, particularly in the energy sector. And so we can kind of go field by field, but again, I would point to my own state of Utah to say, you have regulatory certainty, you have low taxes, you've got a great place to live, and we're thriving. Our unemployment rate is, is about 4.1%. Gary, Farmington, New Mexico, Republican line. Good morning. Good morning to you. Uh, yes, I have a um, point to make. The Democratic Party has aligned themselves with Communist USA. You can Google it and you'll see it. And they're practicing communism. The purpose of the Communist Party is to overthrow capitalism. They do it by weakening the economy and the military strength of the country. And it's against the law. According to the Communist Control Act of 1954, they outlawed the Communist Party, deprived them of rights, privileges, and immunities, which ended up on legal bodies. So, uh, what would you like our guest to address, Gary? I would like him to use the Communist Control Act against the Democratic Party because it's against the law to practice communism. Um, well, you're up early in, in New Mexico. Uh, good morning, but I don't know that I necessarily agree with uh, with that. I'm not familiar with this particular act. I'll, I'll look at it, but I, I just uh, I, I don't know that I, I agree with that approach. We got a lot of good people on both sides of the aisle. I, I can name a host of Democrats that, while I disagree with on a lot of policy and principle, I, I work with. They're good, decent people. I find that most people here are really here for the right reasons. But um, I don't know that I necessarily agree with the premise of your question, but. Nevertheless, good morning in, in New Mexico. An email. This is Carly from Minneapolis asking, when the people agree with a proposal the president makes, how do you justify voting against the people? Shouldn't our representatives pass law the majority of Americans want? I would argue that we're on the right side of, of most of these issues. You've got to tackle them one at a time. There is almost no piece of legislation that comes before the United States Congress that is clean and crisp. I mean, we do have these one- and two-page bills, which I like. I like the ease and the simplicity of bills to tackle one issue at a time. But more often than not, when you get a, a, um, a big bill out there, there are pluses and minuses and really have to make a judgment call. So. Uh, of course, the, you, there's a populist approach in everything you want to do. You want to try to provide uh, the certainty that people need. But if that was the case, we would have done a lot of things to curb back the debt and the deficit in this country. I think uh, most Americans would say, you know what, you should only spend what you get back in receipts. So don't spend more than, than you take in. Would most people agree with that? Yeah, they probably would. Do most people agree that we should be energy independent as opposed to relying overseas? Yeah, I think probably most people do agree with that. But again, it's not the direction this country is taking. So uh, operate on principle. I've taken votes against my own party. And uh, you just got to tackle the issues one at a time. Here's Thomas, Garland, Texas, Democrats line. Hi, yes. Uh, my first uh, question is, uh, what federal employee is actually making minimum wage? I know of none. And if we have over a million illegals and 1.3 million unemployed, how can we pass any immigration bills at this time? 
And also I wanted to say reinstate the unemployment benefits, which is well, thank you. And uh, again, good morning. You're up uh, early there in Texas. Um, uh, you're right. Federal employees um, make a good, healthy wage. And most are patriotic. They work hard. They do a good job. Um, I worry that there are too many people on the federal employee, uh, in, under federal employment. Um, and I think with the president's action this morning, we dealt with the contractors. Again, the president just unilaterally, without Congress, which I think is fundamentally wrong, has just made government that much more expensive. We all have to pay for it. And yet, my, he hasn't made the case on, on the, the justification of this. He hasn't made the case on why we should go out and spend all this. I have no idea what the total cost is going to be to the federal government, nor where he's going to get those, those dollars. Um, as far as unemployment benefits, we have got to get people back on their feet. The idea is to teach people how to fish, not just keep handing them fish. And there are, if you look at the statistics and metrics, I think we can be very compassionate but at the same time, one of the numbers that really scares me is if you go back to the year 2000 until now, there are 30 million, 30 million more people on food stamps than there were in the year 2000. Now, I got to believe that some people are gaming the system. Uh, there are people out there that need it, and absolutely we're going to help them, absolutely. But really, 30 million more people? You have nearly 100 million Americans on some sort of uh, federal assistance? That just strikes me as wrong. When you have somebody who needs our help, we're a compassionate society, of course we're going to help them. But 30 million more on food stamps? I, maybe I shouldn't say this out loud, but I would love to know how many of those people also have the NFL Sunday ticket or DirecTV or the nicest iPhone out there at the same time they're taking food stamps. Uh, that's uh, it's a concern. It's a concern. You brought up immigration. The front page of the New York Times takes a look at immigration efforts in the House. Uh, it says that the House Republican leadership's broad framework for overhauling the immigration laws will call this week for a path to legal status but not citizenship. Where are you when it comes to this, particularly where your leadership is going? Well, there are five bills that we passed out of committee. I'm on the Judiciary Committee that I'm very supportive of. We've got to fix legal immigration. I don't care how big and wide and far your fence is. If you don't fix legal immigration, you never ever solve this problem. So. I, there are things that I'm opposed to. Amnesty, I'm totally opposed to. But there are a number of things that I'm for in fixing legal immigration, getting rid of the rewards and incentives to be here illegally. Uh, visa reform has got to be out there. We have 400,000 plus what are called fugitive aliens in this country. We've got to be able to tackle that issue. One of the things that really bothers me is we don't have an entry exit system into this country. The, the government can't tell you who's come into the country. We have a border crossing card we've handed out. I think it's close to 8 million of these border crossing cards to Mexican nationals. They're only supposed to go 25 miles in some cases, other places 55 miles into the country. Yet we have no exit card or exit program to understand where they've been. I mean, I could go on and on for about an hour. But what I point back to is we passed two bills out of the House. One of them was mine. And last term, we didn't do anything with it. And the sad reality for the Democrats is they had the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and they did nothing, absolutely nothing on immigration. So sometimes you hear uh, uh, Democrats really kind of preach on the need for immigration. Well, guess what? When you had all levers of government in your control, you did nothing. Republicans have shown we're willing to actually do something on this. We passed two bills out yes, uh, last term. Harry Reid did nothing, and now we've got five bills in the queue, and I, I do hope we move forward on One that. of the outsiders looking in is Bill Crystal of the Weekly Standard. He says, quote, it's one of the few things that could actually disrupt what looks like a strong Republican year of the Weekly Standard calling an immigration push, quote, a recipe for disaster. We've got to do things in this country because they're right. I mean, one of the frustrations that I have is we punt these difficult issues because well, it's perpetually an election year. When is it not? When are we not in cycle? I mean, they're already talking about 2016 presidential race. Members of the House are up every other year. I want to tackle difficult issues. Uh, I, why not take more difficult votes? That's what we get elected to do. So that type of talk, because it's just politics, we're still in January, for goodness sake. The election isn't until November. And if you can't explain yourself... Or ex vote if you don't like it, vote no. If you like it, vote yes. A and that's what we need to do more of in this country, not just, well, political calculus says we should just take our time. Every time I've been here, and I haven't been here very long, that's the excuse. You said, though, because you have to do something because it's right. Why is it right, then, in your opinion, to take these stands, especially on immigration, and go the path that's, that it's you're going? It's broken for everybody. There, I, I'm not aware of anybody who thinks that immigration in this country is working properly. 
Uh, I have a woman that I'm working with who's originally from the Philippines. She's now in Australia. She's been going through this process for more than 35 years. She's trying to do it legally and lawfully, and that's the sad reality. Is we're failing those people. The people that are trying to do it legally and lawfully, they're not willing to break the law. They're not willing to overstay their visa. We are failing these people, and we have got to prioritize those people. Those are the people we want to be the next United States citizen, right? They're not willing to come in here illegally, yet we're failing them. Uh, students from Texas Tech University joining us on our C-SPAN bus there at the campus. A uh, photo of them as they sit and wait for their turn. Louis, Louis Godfrey from uh, Texas Tech. Good morning. Go ahead. Good morning, Congressman. How are you this morning? Good morning. Thanks. You guys are up bright and early. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Um, Congressman, how do you feel uh, Congress will perceive immigration reform this, this session? Do you feel that uh, there will be great interest in, in pushing uh, reform uh, this session? Yeah, you know, we, the Senate has a bill, and uh, most people think that they've sent it over to the House of Representatives. They actually didn't. It's got a constitutional problem, and it still sits in the United States Senate. Nevertheless, I believe that we should build uh, upon where we actually agree. That If you look at the Democrats, uh, kind of the the most ardent uh, open border type of, of Democrat out there and, and, and the most strident uh, right-wing Republican, there are actually a lot of things we agree on. So why not just pass the things we agree on? Uh, visa reform, an entry-exit program, uh, these types of things I think have bipartisan support. So one of the classic arguments that we have going on here is the Democrats' argument that we need a one-size bill, you know, we, we need one quote-unquote comprehensive bill, and let's move that through the system. And yet there's something for everybody to hate in there. I don't like amnesty, for instance. Uh, I can't vote in support of amnesty. But can we tackle the other 70% of the problems that are out there with immigration? Yeah. Let's pass one bill at a time, build some common ground, build some trust, I would point to the bill that I passed in the last Congress, which dealt with uh, visa reform and high-skilled immigrants and family-based visas. Right now in this country, for instance, if uh, you're close to the border there in Mexico, uh, people that are from Mexico on the family-based visas can get no more than 7% of the available visas. Well, that seems ridiculous. Our law doesn't take into account proximity or size of country. You're getting the same percentage as, say, Zambia, which is a little bit further away from, and doesn't have nearly the size of population of Mexico. Well, why not bump that up to 15%? We voted on that. We agreed in the House on uh, nearly 390 votes. Why not pass that? Just do one issue at a time, and I think we'll have more progress. Morrow is from Hopewell Junction, New York, Republican line. Good morning. Yes, good morning. I, I, I want to talk about the uh, minimum wage. Okay. I, I think it's a terrible, terrible idea to try and raise it. Minimum wage was never supposed to be for people to earn a living. Minimum wage was supposed to be for young children, youngsters, to be able to be hired after school during the summers to make a few dollars, and, and, and hopefully they would be at the bottom rung of the company and maybe stay with the company and grow. People who think that they're going to make a living on minimum wage are only kidding themselves. The only way you're going to make a decent living, you need to get an education. Yeah, there's a lot of truth in that, and I feel for the people that are, that are struggling along, but I do think... The answer to this long-term solution is through education. It, there, it is very difficult for somebody to, to continue to live on that minimum wage. You've got to show some aptitude. So you've got to work hard. You've got to improve your skill set. Um, companies have a financial incentive to keep you there if you know your job and, and whatnot. But again, I point, and I, it sounds like we're agreeing on this, I would look at the youth, and when you just automatically say, well, we've got to pay everybody more, what you're also saying is, we're not going to teach that 16-year-old the value of a dollar and how to work, and that is a huge missed opportunity in this nation. I think that the previous generations actually did a better job of getting their kids to work, getting their fingernails dirty. It's one of the most important things I did was my dad laid the newspaper in front of me, and I had to get a job, and I worked as a gardener in Arizona. It was awful. <laughs> it was tough, but it's one of the most important things I did. And yet, if you're going to force employers to go through all these gyrations with Obamacare and the minimum wage, and all, guess what? The employers, they're just not going to do it. And we're going to lose this generation who's got to get up off the couch, get away from that Xbox and PlayStation, and actually do some work. And I would also challenge the Democrats, if you're so ardent on this, then why not get rid of all the exceptions out there? There are a host of industries 
that don't have a minimum wage and uh, have exemptions from the minimum wage. And if you're going to get serious, Democrats, about the minimum wage, let's tackle those industries because my guess is you're not going to do it. There's, there's a reason why they had these people have exceptions. Texas Tech founded in 1923, located in Lubbock, Texas. 33,000 students attending the state university. Some of those students on our C-SPAN bus. It's part of our C-SPAN bus tour of uh, the Big 12 Conference, as they're calling it. Here's Anna Lavis, student. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, and thank you for speaking with me, Representative. My question is, I'm about to graduate and go into the real world. And recently, uh, Aetna CEO has come out and said that if young, healthy adults do not apply for Obamacare, then there will be massive premium increases. So my question to you is, what are my incentives for enrolling in the Affordable Care Act? Well, Anna, good morning. Uh, I wish nothing but the best to you, but this is one of the fundamental challenges I have with uh, so-called Obamacare. I, I voted more than 40 times to repeal it. Um, I recognize as long as the president's uh, in office, it's going to continue to be here. But there are many um, perverse uh, actions that happen because of Obamacare. And look, I want people to be responsible. I do think young people should get health care insurance. I don't think they should be forced to do it. I don't think the federal government should force them to do this. But I do think it is the responsible thing for people to do. And, and we do need more participants in this. You never know when you might have that unfortunate accident or disease or something else that's going to happen, and we don't want people to be caught financially uh, for the rest of us to have to end up uh, paying for it. But Obamacare is not the right prescription for making this happen. It's just not. Uh, our next call, Terry, Akron, Ohio, Independent Line. Good morning. Yeah, Congressman, I was just wondering, uh, you you mentioned how you had reforms uh, with your public unions in Utah, and uh, you 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 made them go from a, a guaranteed pension to a 401k. And I just think the Republicans they are against unions, they are against uh, things like that. Would you be willing, as a congressman, and you guys have a real generous pension system, would you be willing to give up your guaranteed pension and go to a 401k and I'll listen off the air thank you well thank you no I and look I appreciate it uh, a defined contribution is a t as opposed to a defined benefit plan uh, is the right uh, direction for for what we're supposed to do federal employees have a have a, a pension uh, program that is involved and engaged and I've, uh, I've I'm not yet a recipient of this I, I'm uh, a bit younger than that um, I'm not anti, one thing I guess I disagree with you on is this whole idea that I'm anti-union. I'm actually working with the, the union, for instance, on Customs and Border Patrol on uh, some reforms to their pay. They, uh, they actually introduced it to me and said, hey, we'd like to reform our pay structure. I'm working closely with them. So by default, I'm not actually anti-pension. Uh, uh, I'm not anti-union. Uh, but I do worry that some of the collective bargaining agreements and some of the things that we're doing are contrary to what we should be doing as, as a nation, particularly with the law enforcement side of the equation. But again, we'd have to get into a deeper, broader um, uh, uh, discussion about that. I don't think that necessarily uh, pensions are um, evil, but when you have states like Illinois and California that haven't funded their pension programs, then I got a real problem with The first resolution that I introduced in this Congress was a resolution that says don't look to the states to try to reimburse you on this. You have as a state, as a municipality, the county governments, they have got to be responsible for these rich pensions that they threw out there. Look what happened in San Jose, California. You, and I think you're going to have a host of cities, counties, and states that are going to want to and need to uh, file for bankruptcy. Do it in a financially prudent way and don't think that the rest of America should have to pay to bail you out of these rich pensions. Uh, Representative Chief, it's uh, former Secretary of State Clinton yesterday before automobile dealers yeah. addressed the topic of Benghazi and talked a little bit about her experience and thoughts on it. Want to play a, some of what she said, get your response to it. You know, my, my, my biggest you know, regret is what happened in Benghazi. Uh, it was a terrible tragedy, uh, losing four Americans to uh, diplomats and now it's public, so I can say to CIA operatives. 
losing an ambassador like Chris Stevens, who was one of our very best and had served in Libya and across the Middle East and spoke Arabic and was really well regarded by the vast majority of Libyans whom he came into contact with. Um, so it was a it was a it was a great loss. Uh, it was a great loss to our foreign service, a great loss to our country, and it illustrated one of the biggest problems that I faced as Secretary of State. We have a lot of dangerous locations where we send not our military but our civilians, and they go in. They have language skills often. They try to assess what's going on in the area. Um, Representative Chaffetz, her thoughts? Well, look, we're united in the idea that uh, that was a regrettable situation. And I look at what the United States Senate did under the leadership of Dianne Feinstein, a Democrat who came out and they used the word preventable. This was preventable. You know, we've got to remember that on April 6, 2012, our facility in Benghazi was bombed. You move forward two months to June 6, 2012, it was bombed again. And what happened to the security profile there? They actually went at the end of July from having 30 security personnel there in, in Libya to less than 10. Now, you got to ask yourself, why did that happen? Why did we create what is ultimately a death trap there? Well, it was Hillary Clinton that was the Secretary of State, and she testified months after the attack that it was the people on the ground that made security decisions. That's not true. That is not true. We heard from Eric Nordstrom and, and Lieutenant Colonel Wood. That was absolutely not true. So there are still a lot of questions that I think she, Secretary Clinton, and others have got to answer, not just about the talking points, but why is it that they created this death trap? Why is it that it was preventable, according to the Democrats in the United States Senate? Why is it that our response was so pathetic? And then why is it that Secretary Clinton, President Obama, Secretary uh, Panetta lied to the American people for weeks. And why is it more than a year after that we finally get some comments out of Secretary Clinton? Because I think the poll numbers are not going her direction. But we're going to get the answer to these questions. The families have still never been given to the truth. Nobody's been captured or killed. We don't know why they moved from 30 personnel down to, to nine personnel in terms of security after our own facility was bombed twice. There are just so many unanswered questions, and, and the, the only reason we are still going through this is this administration continues to stonewall us and our ability to talk to people. Think about this. It's happened in, in September 11, 2012, and America has still never heard from somebody who was on the ground that night in Benghazi in the public setting. Never. That's just not acceptable. Will she be back to testify on this issue? Do you I think? would love her to do it. I think she should volunteer to do that, uh, but we'll continue with our investigation. Al, I'm sorry, we'll go to Peyton. Peyton Craig, Texas Tech University. Good morning. Morning, Congressman. Thanks so much for being on with me. Oh, good morning. Um, here at Texas Tech, as well as all universities that do research, federal research funding is a, a very key importance. Do you yeah. believe that certain fields hold the priority in federal research spending? Great question. Um, cancer. Uh, I, I tell you, without a doubt, um, uh, cancer took my mother's life, took my great aunt uh, Wheezy's life, took my father's life. We have in this country uh, about 1,500 people a day die because of cancer. There is not a person there at Texas Tech or anybody watching this show that doesn't have a loved one, a friend or a relative that has been t hasn't been touched by cancer. And when you have something that is killing 1,500 Americans, 1,500 Americans a day, that should be a national priority. If it was up for me, I would triple the funding. Right now, we're at about eight billion dollars. You telling me we don't have $24 billion out of a $3.6 trillion budget to fight something that's killing 1,500 Americans? This nation should be focused on this like a laser beam and a tackle cancer. That's, I get fired up about this. Um, it's very personal for me, and uh, it's something that should be a national priority. And I'm as fiscally conservative as a Republican that it is, but that's something that, as a conservative, when, we're, when it's killing 1,500 people a day, that's where we should be spending some money. Ashley Brannon from Texas Tech University, you're up next. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, in your in your introduction, you referenced getting trained up for um, for jobs uh, as opposed to just minimum wage. And um, so while I was in D.C. this past semester, Texas Tech opened a new major that I'm thrilled to be part of. However, that also means I have more time left in my undergraduate career. 
So with the student loan balloons, what kind of reforms would we be seeing as a result of this situation since the cost of attending a public university continues to rise? Yeah, hey, the, I, I wish there was an easy solution to this, but you're right. One of the things that's rising faster than inflation is the cost of uh, that type of education at these universities. Uh, I wish I had a simple, easy answer to that. I don't. One of the things that the Democrats pushed through on their so-called reform of the student loan program is they really pushed the private sector out of the business of being able to provide these types of loans. I don't see the wisdom in that. I think the competition, the opportunity to have some private entities also offering these types of loans would be a good thing. If we can also tackle the idea of helping to drive down the cost of this type of education, but I wish I had a good, simple, easy answer for you. Uh, I don't. Um, I, but I want people to be able to value this education and be able to get a job. And until we change some of the fundamental uh, direction of this country and the policies that uh, President Obama is pursuing, it, we're going to continue to struggle. Al from Sanford, Florida, Democrats line. Yeah, how you doing, Mr. Drew? You're in the Congressman. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been listening to uh, C-SPAN almost 10 years, and uh, I, 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 I own a small business here in Florida, an uh, irrigation company. And I'll be so glad... And I, I pay, I pay none of my employees, employees less than twelve dollars an hour. And I'm wondering what this country would think going to happen if these people who can't afford the, uh, a ten dollar ten cent minimum wage, what do you think going to happen? What I think going to happen is I'm going to get a lot of those jobs, and I'll be able to pay my employees a little more, a lot more than what I'm paying them now. Yeah, well, the, you know, some basic economics for a small business. I wish you nothing but the the best of luck. If the federal government is going to force you to pay your people more, what are you going to do? You're either going to pass those expenses on to your customers or you're going to hire less people. I mean, that's the economic reality uh, of what's going to happen to a business. And so, yeah, the big corporations out there, they're going to be able to take care of themselves, you know, the big, big companies out there. But those smaller businesses that maybe have 30 employees, or I don't know how many employees, you have 10 employees, whatever it might be, then you got some problems and some challenges. You couple that with the rising costs under Obamacare, and you got a formula that's going to make business very difficult for the small business, which is the, the life, but they're the engine of, of what makes uh, America tick. So one of the deep concerns. We're almost out of time, but we want to hear from the last student from Texas Tech University, Alex Blitz. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Congressman. I just wanted to start by saying thank you once again for taking the time today to answer our questions here. And uh, my question actually comes from personal experience. This previous semester, I was fortunate enough to represent uh, our university and serving in the congressional internship program we have here. Um, while interning, I obviously witnessed firsthand the effects of the government shutdown. So my question is, with most polls and studies conducted during the shutdown showing that the majority of Americans accredited the Republican Party and specifically far right facets of the Republican Party, such as the Tea Party movement. How do you think that will affect the Republicans in the next upcoming election? Well, Alex, uh, thanks for getting up so bright and early and joining us and being involved and engaged. Look, that was uh, the strategy of moving through that process the way they did. It, it, it was wrong. Now, I tell you, 14 times in a row, I voted to keep the government open. So um, it's a little erroneous to just simply blame the Republicans on this. Um, but nevertheless, I think, quite frankly, all the federal employees got back pay. They essentially got a couple of weeks paid vacation. So let's be honest, they got paid. They didn't have to come into work. Um, was it the right thing to do? Absolutely not. But at the same time, uh, by the time I think the election rolls around uh, next year, most people will look at that, and uh, it probably won't be very high on their priority. It's not something that will come up again. We pass bills that get, get us through the funding mechanism. Uh, so there is no threat of the government shutdown going into the next election. Um, but I appreciate the question. Thank you. We want to thank the students at Texas Tech and their academic yeah. advisor, Lauren Dent. Uh, to that end, mm -hmm. what you just said, as far as the debt ceiling is concerned, there's a date been established by the Treasury Department. Do Republicans know what they want to ask for in return for a vote on the debt ceiling? Not yet. We haven't got a cohesive answer to that yet. I will tell you that uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, House Republicans are going to gather in a strategy session, and one of the key topics that we're going to get through is, to, is how to deal with the debt ceiling. We can't just keep raising the debt ceiling. When President Obama was Senator Obama, he took that position, uh, and I think it's right. You, you can't just simply... Look, at when I started five years ago, the national debt was about $9 trillion. Now it's more than... $17 trillion. You just can't keep doing this in perpetuity. What would you like to see then? Well, we got to spend less. 
uh, in, in our federal government. I mean, I, I just think of the equation is very simple. You also have to tackle entitlement reform. If we don't tackle Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, how those are funded into the future, you never, ever solve this equation. Republican uh, representative from Utah, Jason Chaffetz, thank you for your time. Thanks, Thanks for having me. And a quick reminder that our coverage of the State of the Union Address begins tonight at 8 Eastern with a preview program. The address itself will start at 9. We'll also have the Republican response from Republican Conference Committee Chair Kathy McMorris-Rogers shortly after the President's speech. And we invite your involvement, your reaction. We'll take your phone calls, emails, tweets, and your Facebook comments. It'll be on C-SPAN, C-SPAN Radio, and C-SPAN.org. A quorum call continuing here on the Senate floor. Senators today taking up the flood insurance bill. It would delay scheduled federal flood insurance rate increases for four years. The Senate is expected to recess for their weekly party lunches at 12.30 Eastern today. They will be back at 2.15 for more flood insurance debate. And while we wait for the Senate to return, the Senate today continuing work on legislation that would delay scheduled federal flood rate increases for four years. The premium increases were approved in 2012 to help the financial stability of the National Flood Insurance Program. Louisiana Senator Mary Landrieu, who is the lead sponsor of the legislation, spoke earlier today about the bill and the path forward here in the Senate. Then on the bill uh, that's before us, and I really appreciate the cooperation of so many members uh, last night that voted to move forward on the debate of the fix to Bigot Waters. We had a very strong, very impressive vote. I think 83 members. Uh, Republicans and Democrats came together from all parts of the country, uh, from all different um, uh, areas and districts and backgrounds to vote to move forward on the debate on flood insurance. And I'm really grateful. Uh, we've been working on this for about a year and a half. Uh, it's been a tough slog uh, because two years ago, a bill called Bigger Waters would, was passed, named after their two co-sponsors in the House. Congresswoman Biggert and Congresswoman Waters, who passed a bill with very good intentions, thinking that they were going to strengthen the flood insurance program. The bill had wonderful intentions, but unfortunately, the way it was finally drafted in the conference committee, it's had disastrous results. And some of us knew that two years ago and started working literally the moment the bill the conference bill was passed to begin changing it. And so we have worked diligently and together and built a great coalition. I really want to thank the 200 organizations that came quickly together over the last year and a half, as quickly as any of these things can really happen in a practical sense, to really understand what went wrong in the first bill how we could fix it so we could accomplish two really important goals for the National Flood Insurance Program. One, that the program could be self-sustaining, in other words, pay for itself with limited or minimal taxpayer um, burden. But the other equally important goal, and you know, Mr. President, representing New Jersey, how important this is, just like I understand this from Louisiana, the other equally important goal was that the program could be affordable to middle class families. Because if it's not affordable to middle class families, they won't participate in it, and the program will go bankrupt for lack of participation. In insurance, the idea is to have a large pool to spread the risk, and that's how an insurance system works. Well, what Bigger Waters did, and if we don't fix it, is going to make that pool get smaller and smaller and smaller because people will not be able to afford it. The program will collapse and the taxpayers will be saddled with debt. So the goal of our coalition, which is led by uh, Menendez, Senator Menendez, your senior senator from New Jersey who's on the banking committee, who's been one of the great spokesmen for this and leaders, Senator Isaacson from Georgia, who is literally the most respected member in this whole body on issues related to real estate because he has one of the largest or had one of the largest real estate companies in Atlanta, knows the issue well, is very respected on both sides of the aisle. These two gentlemen have led this effort and have built a bipartisan coalition. So we are now ready this week 
Of all weeks, it's a State of the Union week. We would have probably preferred another one, but it's just the way this worked um, to debate the uh, bill on the floor of the Senate. At last count, when we left, there were about six or seven relevant amendments, which is the only amendments that we're going to accept, relevant amendments to this bill. We're not going to accept amendments that are on other subjects in an effort to derail the Senate, get us off topic, et cetera, et cetera. We will accept only relevant amendments to this bill. And the happy thing is, we think we only have about seven or eight. Some amendments are Republican, some amendments are Democratic. Now, we just received an amendment from one of the opponents of our bill, uh, the good senator from Pennsylvania, who has not been supportive of our bill. Uh, who has not worked with the coalition, who has not cooperated in any way. He's filed an amendment just, we got it an hour ago. We've been actually waiting for a year and a half. Um, last May, he opposed the bill, and we couldn't even get to the debate because he wasn't happy in the direction that we're going in. So that happened in May. It's now, what is this month? Um, January. <laughs> We're in January. So he opposed the bill in May. It set us back seven months. We tried to explain to the senator from Pennsylvania that 74,000 people in his state have these policies and that they too need help. Whether he's been able to reconcile that with his uh, constituents, I don't know. But we literally, after asking and asking and asking for his comments, his thoughts, his input, Please let us know what we can do. We'll be happy to meet with you. The home builders will sit down, the realtors. We finally, at the last hour, get a draft of his amendment in the last hour. So we're literally reading it for the first time. I don't think that's cooperation, but he may have a different definition of it. So we're reading that amendment now. I don't believe this amendment is going to help our cause. I think it's going to undermine what we're trying to do. I will have you know, more comments about the specifics of it. Um, but the senator from Pennsylvania, for whatever reason, has just not been cooperative the whole time. We'll be happy to vote on his amendment. I think the amendment is going to do great harm to the bill. And I think I would urge our coalition at this point to vote no. But I'm going to go look at it. Senator Isaacson has just received a copy of it uh, in the last hour. And all I can do is ask our colleagues to be patient while we review this 13-page amendment. We're trying to get, you know, we have 200 organizations that have been working on this. We're trying to, you know, be fair and get their input, and then we will know how to proceed. But the bottom line is this. This week, we are going to pass a flood insurance relief bill off the floor of the United States Senate. And I want to put everybody here on notice that we have run out of patience. We have been working on this for a year and a half. We were told before Christmas we could have a vote, then we were told we could have a vote when we got back, then we were told we could have a vote before you know, we left. This is it. There's no more time. We're voting on this this week. We're either going to do it the easy way or the hard way. We're either going to have a few amendments that the Republicans put up, the Democrats put up, and we get back to legislating like we should, or the leader. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam President, this month we celebrate the 41st anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in Roe v. Wade, a ruling 